Thank you, Dr. Kumar, Chair Man of the Session, Co-Chair Dr. Garwal, uh, leading lights from the industry and the academy on the dais and present here. Dr. J.S. Sharma, the driving force behind this meet today. I have been asked to give a brief about the initiatives that the downstream refining sector is taking. So as I speak here, standing before you, I realize I represent the industry, which in some ways is responsible for the GHG emissions and has, in fact, a substantial role. But we have been focused on our responsibility for a cleaner environment. And the initiatives that I'll be going to talk about, which uh, have been in the newspapers, in conferences, in reports so far. But before I come to the new innovative technologies, some in the very early stage, some quite mature. I would like to focus on the basics, lest it be forgotten. And Dr. Sen Gupta also mentioned it. And that is the focus on energy efficiency. What's the role of the energy efficiency? In fact, the last week, the global conference on energy efficiency was held in Denmark where IEA, International Energy Agency, shared a projection that if we maintain a rate of 4% per annum of energy efficiency improvement, by the end of this decade, we'll be able to save around 95 exajoules of energy, which is the current requirement of China. And it will uh, indirectly and directly translate to around 5 billion tons of uh, saving in uh, CO2 emissions. For the downstream sector, 60% of the emissions can be directly attributed to our stationary commercial emissions. The balance may be coming from the process emissions and the fugitive emissions. So conscious of the role of the energy efficiency as in decarbonization of the sector. Government of India had way back announced a scheme called Perform, Achieve, and Trade, more properly known as the PAT scheme. The PAT cycle six, which is started in 2020, is targeting a uh, uh, improvement of around 7% in uh, energy efficiency by 2023. When we look across the spectrum of the downstream sector in uh, India, then the efficiencies are varying from 48 MBN for Reliance Jamnagar to more than 100 for the older refineries. So there's a lot of scope, there's a lot of opportunity for improvement of the energy efficiency. Coming to process emissions, now that's where we'll have to look for the new technologies. Process, process emissions in the industry, uh, downstream industry, the main uh, players, the contributors are FCC, and then the hydrogen generation unit, which normally uses the steam, methane reforming, or natural gas reforming, coca, et cetera. And that's uh, the factors where to mitigate the carbon, COT emission, GHG emissions, we'll have to look towards deployment of the new technologies like uh, CCUS, view or green hydrogen, and CO2 valorization. My task actually has been made much easier in the morning by the Honorable Minister Nitin Gadkari when he mentioned some of these schemes that Indian Oil Corporation has been, uh, is actually in the process of taking. So as far as the CCUS is concerned, Mr. Rajiv Kumar also mentioned the feasibility report for that project where we will be supplying uh, CO2 capture from our Gujarat unit to ONGC field, Gandhar oil field, around 110 kilometers away. Initially, 
uh, in phase one, 750 tons per day. It is, and this has to go up to 100, 1,500 tons per day. The feasibility report is ready and next actions are going to be taken soon. Two initiatives that the Honorable Minister mentioned in the morning. One is, uh, both of them are pertaining to bioethanol production, but they pertain to different categories of the technology. One is the second generation, and another is third generation. So the second generation you mentioned that we'll be setting up, in fact, we hope it will come online by August, where we are aiming we'll be using the crop residue to produce around 100 kL per day of bioethanol. Another project is of uh, third generation where uh, the refinery of gases will be converted to lipids and uh, ethanol, methanol, which uh, uh, we have taken up in collaboration with lens attack. So these are two very important uh, initiatives in this field. A very important thing that has been mentioned is because CCUS, okay, we are capturing carbon, but the issue is what are you going to do with it? Now, storing all that carbon in oil wells does not have a potential for long. Ultimately, you have to look at ways how to make CO2 more use. So a lot of work is going on CO2 valorization technologies, and which, which basically are uh, aligned along four areas. One is use of CO2 for the production of raw materials like uh, methane, light olefins, and then for synthesis of advanced materials, CO2-based polymers, and then to produce fuels, methanol, biodiesel, and also CO2 as a solvent uh, for supercritical extraction. Biofuels is where uh, the world is looking forward. And I've already mentioned the initiative that we are going to take Indian oil on a pilot basis. The projects are coming up in Panipat refinery. Low carbon synthetic fuels is an area where a lot of work is going on globally. And on a pilot basis, Shell has recently produced synthetic kerosene, which is actually being marketed as sustainable aviation fuel to KLM in Netherlands. CCUS projects I'm talking about, actually CCUS technology has been quite old, more than 40 years. The first project came in US in 1972. Today, there are still 27 projects operational with a capacity of around 40, 50 mm TPA. 108 more projects are in the line at, at, at various stages of it. CCUS will have to, in fact, be sustainable itself when we uh, marry it with CO2 valorization techniques. Coming to the next area that, that we, uh, the, which has attracted a lot of focus and attention is green hydrogen. But before that, actually for the industry, because ultimately these investments, these technologies are extremely investment heavy, require a lot of investment, Dr. Kumar, mentioned in this uh, presentation earlier that an estimate is that for India it would be around 700 lakh rupees. So we'll have to choose the technologies with uh, a lot of uh, discretion and a judicious selection of the technologies. So blue hyd though the focus is on green hydrogen, blue hydrogen as far as the O and G oil and gas sector is concerned is not going away. There are a lot of uh, projects in the blue hydrogen. Shell was the first one to move into blue hydrogen when they set up this facility at Pernis in Netherlands. 
Today also, there are around 18 projects which have been lined up. Five of them in the Netherlands, five of them in UK, some in Australia and US, where the route is taken through the blue hydrogen. For the green hydrogen, the main issue is more than the technical, it is the financial and economical challenge because producing green hydrogen is quite costly. Whatever electrolyzer technology you are talking about, whether it is alkaline electrolyzer or it is PEM electrolyzer, both are uh, extremely costly. Alkaline electrolyzer, the capital cost could vary from 750 to 850 dollars per megawatt, whereas for the green hydrogen, it may go as high as 1,200 to 1,800, depending on the factors. And in the running cost compared to the gray hydrogen, which is normally used in the refining sector, uh, will also be around three to three and a half times. So the projects are coming. Indian oil also is moving in that direction. With the first project coming up at Mathura Refinery, where I come from, a five KTPA capacity, feasibility studies are going on. Another one is coming up at Pani but to KTPA. So success of these uh, projects will depend a lot on actually access to the project finance and then some clarity on the carbon pricing issues, which would be actually key to the success of these technologies. Coming back to the developments in the world, yes, in uh, electrolyzer technology, two projects, both of them in Germany. One is uh, at Schindler Ref Refinery in Hamburg, which is uh, five megawatt capacity, around 0.7 kT of hydrogen. Another one is uh, at Shell Rhineland Refinery with a capacity of 10 megawatt. And another project of, again, Shell, Fredericia Refinery, is uh, slated to come up early in 2023 or 24 of 20 megawatt capacity. A lot of action is taking place in Europe, European Union, with around 1.3 gigawatt capacity of electrolysis projects are under development. So the aim is that by uh, these projects have to be completed by 2025. Close to another 700 megawatt projects are aimed not at the refinery or down the steam sector, but to produce merchant hydrogen linked to refining operations along with other applications. So a lot of exciting developments are going on. I have been reading in the newspaper this uh, a project in Norway of blue crude, where they are going to, I mean, uh, which again is a synthetic blue crude produced from CO2 only. So the technology, all these technologies are off track, uh, are basically a takeoff on a very old technology, which was uh, first time, uh, I mean, demonstrated in 1920s, that is Fisher trough synthesis. Most of the projects that we are talking about are variations of, of Fisher Trough's technology only. Shell also has made improvements on it. And the first uh, project which was based on this was basically a gas to liquids project in Malaysia. And the second one, which is operating in Qatar, uh, Pearl GTL, Pearl Gas to Liquid. In the morning, there was talk about coal gasification. Again, coal gasification uh, is uh, quite old. South Africa set up the first coal gasification plant based on the same Fisher Trough technology in 1958 and then 1980. The second one at Sassol, and now there is third one at Sassol. So a lot of development is taking place in the refineries, uh, in the technology, and a lot of work is being done on improving the technology, bringing in new catalysts, new membranes, new ways to do the same thing. 
So, with all these developments, I hope that we shall surely be able to meet the target that has been committed in COP26 of uh, going net zero by uh, 2017. Thank you very much.